Well, good morning, church. It's a little strange not to be with you in person, but thankfully I'm joining you online from home uh, as we worship this morning. I uh, wanted to take a moment and introduce to you today's preacher, Craig Petty. Uh, Craig and I go back a long way from our original days in Bible college. Uh, since then, Craig's worked at a, a larger church in Melbourne as well as now in his new role in Compassion, where he's helping equip churches for their mission both locally and beyond. Uh, really value Craig's heart. He has a huge love for people and a real passion for the mission that God has given and a hunger to see the church engage uh, more freely and, and readily in our community. So really looking forward to what Craig has to share with us uh, this morning and uh, super excited to be back with you next Sunday. Bless you guys. Well, good morning, everyone. It's really a privilege to be here this morning to be able to share some thoughts and uh, speak with you. I've been married for 20 years, which is just a little bit shorter than what I've known Nathan for. We, we uh, used to hang out at Bible College, and I think of conversations we had in the cafe there. What seems like a lifetime ago, so it's a real privilege to be able to share with you this morning. I've been married for 20 years. We got to um, uh, celebrate our anniversary earlier this year by going up to tropical North Queensland, which was wonderful. We've got four kids. The eldest is 18, the youngest is 11, and we we're able to be away by ourselves for probably one of the few times we have in the last 20 years. My wife managed to get stung by jellyfish. I was okay, but we were freaked out. And the Queensland uh, lifeguard says, don't worry, that's a little one. That sting will dissipate in the next few hours. So we were not put at ease at all. But anyway, that's part of the adventure of life. I had said to my wife before I left home this morning that I had the privilege of speaking on one of my favourite topics this morning. She says, oh, you mean me? <laughs> and after we'd spent a long time laughing about her joke... Uh, and, and, and things had gone quiet for a moment, I said, on that topic of unity together in shared mission. When I was uh, 15 years old, I went on my first beach mission through Scripture Union, and I'll share a little bit of a moment I had in that experience uh, in a little while as well. But today, I guess the context for me coming to speak with you is um, a project that I've been involved in in the city of Whitehorse for now a few years since it started. Actually, at the encouragement of Nathan and my uh, previous principal, Cheryl, who was a minister in the area as well, there was a group of pastors and ministers in the city of Whitehorse that got together and said, we've been meeting together, we've been praying together now for a number of years. What do we need to do to take that next step in caring for our city? And so a, a, a vision for a winter shelter was born. But there was a recognition that it wasn't just one project. It was actually bigger than that. And in order to theologize, to understand our shared mission together, we used that, um, that chapter and that verse that was shared just before, Jeremiah 29, 7. The people of God in exile, in cities and regions that weren't their own. How do we live out being the people of God in this space where people aren't living in the way that we would want to prescribe for them, where they're not carrying our faith? How do we live? as exiles in the place that, we, uh, that we're in, we do it with the, with the blessing or the invitation from Jeremiah 29.7, seek the well-being, the shalom of your city. That word shalom, nothing missing, nothing broken, everything complete and in its right place. Seek the shalom of your city, for in its Shalom, its well-being, you will find your own. So we adopted that as our mission. Now uh, 31 churches in the city of Whitehorse have joined an association to say, yes, 
we will work together and we will share this mission of caring for our local community. It's one of those things I've now uh, finished pastoring in the area but still involved on the board because the way I describe it, it's one of those things that uh, now that I've seen it, I can't unsee it. It's a glorious thing to see uh, brothers and sisters working together and praying that his kingdom would come, care for the city would be realized. We gathered together with not that many churches to begin with and, and we said to the city council that we're working together and their shoulders dropped and they exhaled and they said, wow, if you're going to work together, we can work with that. And then we, uh, the, the local police got wind of what we were doing and it turns out the police have several hundred people on a register uh, that they visit every week or call every month because they're vulnerable and lonely and isolated and they keep a check in on them. Who would have known that the police do that? They said, well, if the churches are working together, can, can we do some partnership? And so during COVID, we had the delight of the police distributing bags that had been packed by a Church of Christ, but say Anglican Church on the side of it. Oh, sorry, I'm destroying the church. Yeah. I'll, I'll step back. Um, and, and wonderful things like that. I was, I was in a first aid course training for the, uh, the activity that we were doing last year for the winter shelter where each church, seven churches in the area, open their doors one night a, a week and then uh, v volunteers came to join us and so on. Because of COVID, we didn't get to run for that for long, but it made the point we're able to exercise care for people and find them further care moving on. But, but I was in a first aid course, and the, a lady who was also doing the first aid course says to me, what are you here for? And I described that, I described it in the words of my Lutheran friend. I said, the churches in the city of Whitehorse have tried everything else except working together. We thought we'd give that a go. And she laughed a little bit, and then she said a word that I'd never... Well, I've heard it before, but I wouldn't say it in a church. I wouldn't say it at all. She said a word that we wouldn't normally hear in a church. And she says, well, if Christians can work together, I could believe in a God like that. Psalm 133, as we've heard this morning, is part of what's called the Songs of Ascents. It was a, it's a collection at the end of the book of Psalms of 18 songs that were sung on the way up to Jerusalem for festivals. Jerusalem uh, is up higher than the surrounding areas and so the pilgrims would come to a festival to meet with God by preparing themselves on that very physical way up on that journey. I really appreciated the words of communion this morning. I thought it was wonderful to celebrate together. In many ways, that's, uh, that's the kind of um, process that the pilgrims would journey through up to Jerusalem, coming before in those beautiful words that you shared before God with something very practical and visceral for us to experience. How good. Of course, those of you who've been around in church life for a while would know that by reading a Bible in English, we sometimes miss some of the wow moments. And so one of the wow moments is right here in that second word, good. The word good, tobe, literally meaning beautiful, is a word that is scattered in various places through the Old Testament. It's a Hebrew word. The Old Testament came, in, uh, comes to, came to us in Hebrew. How good reminds the listener, the pilgrim, of that very first story, you know, the one in Genesis 1, where God makes the world and it is Good, beautiful. How good reminds the listener, the pilgrim, as they travel up to Jerusalem to meet with God, reminds the listener that 
that it's also not good for us to be alone. And we know the story of the creation of Adam, but also his need for Eve. God's good creation being built out of relationship and with a need for relationship. We have always been built for relationship. We have been made in the image of a God who is community, a trinity, Father, Son, Holy Spirit, and made in his image, God realized it is his good or his very good creation, but it is not good for us to be alone. How good is packed with meaning, meaning about community, meaning about the original way that God intended and made his perfect earth in the beginning. How good and pleasant it is when brothers or the new uh, NIV version, I checked it, it's a bit more inclusive. It says when God's people live together in unity. I love to go um, walking early in the morning. It's back to being dark at that time again. And as I walk, I pray, I meditate. And I think this morning I was doing that. And meditating on this particular passage and what I might share this morning and came back inside not to what is probably more normal than not, a dispute amongst one or two of the four siblings. It was the opposite. I came in and there's two, my younger two, 11 and 13, humming and singing away and doing something cooperatively together. Oh, how good and pleasant it is when brothers and sisters dwell together in unity. Eugene Peterson in The Journey covers this particular passage and he says it's, um, it's a pretty evocative simile that's being used here in Psalm 133 because the, the, the kinship uh, uh, symbolism here Brothers, sisters, evokes powerful message because everyone knows siblings argue. If there's going to be arguments anywhere in the world, it's probably going to be amongst siblings in a place that's safe relationally, in a place where you're competing for this, that, or the other thing. He reminds us that Cain and Abel were siblings bit of rivalry there, reminds us that Joseph ended up down a pit because of his siblings, bit of issues there. Sibling rivalry is something that we understand, competition or or wrestling inside of a nuclear family because we're wrestling to find our place in the world. And hopefully we can help our kids to work through that and put love in action. So says God, how good and pleasant it is when brothers and sisters dwell together in unity. You're hitting something that comes from the original good. This is stellar. It's like precious oil poured on the head, running down the beard, running down Aaron's beard, down on the collar of his robes. Parents say at this point, well, how so? How to get your, and it's great to hear you've got a parenting course, recommend you sign up because we, it's so important the way we represent God's heart to our kids. But we say, well, if people are arguing, then how do we resolve it? And Eugene Peterson again would say, Well, have a look at the next verse and recognize that God's presence is on our brothers and sisters. See his image, his mark and his imprint on our brothers and sisters. Oil represents holiness. Oil represents something that is given by God. Of course, it had a very practical application in Um, days gone by where people who were dusty would turn up as travelers. They would get their feet washed and their head poured with olive oil. 
that would run down their head and onto their beard. And I tried that once in a church. We put someone, my colleague, in a baptism tank and I got the cheaper oil poured four liters over his head and he said that was quite a suffocating experience his wife also commented to me because somehow she'd been deputized to wash up afterwards how difficult it was to get out of clothing it's not a symbol that we necessarily relate to in our present day but the point being in a dry and parched place in a dusty place. Oil symbolizes the washing, the cleanliness, the holiness of God coming to sustain our lives and to nourish us. So if the Jew of Hermon were falling on Mount Zion, for there the Lord bestows his blessing, even life forevermore. It's like that Jew of Hermon that would... Land, that would Um, turn up every night on their local mountain. It was as if that was coming on Mount Zion, a fierce image of God's presence with us and the place that unity carries. Isn't it a great theory? How good and pleasant it is when brothers and sisters come together in Unity. I'm part of Compassion's work and, and we, we work primarily overseas and celebrate your work with uh, Baptist World Aid and champion that, which is brilliant. We're also doing some work locally to help catalyze local mission together. And I was in a region just this week where a group of churches in a region have become so divided about one political, one, a political approach to certain thing. And I just came away after meeting with a few of the pastors, feeling grief about that. Celebrate our distinctives as different churches in areas. But my prayer is become so uh, my my prayer for unity has become central that I feel the grief when we can't get along in our shared mission together our shared mission together being united together is good as good as it gets it's soothing it's refreshing it's holy and it sustains life But you could be forgiven for saying, well, Craig, where's this going? Because I can see the value of unity in community. But what does that have to do with crossing the road and applying this to mission? If we could flick to, we didn't read this this morning, but if we could go to John 13. John 13 is um, the beginning of Jesus' long dialogue with his disciples at the Last Supper before he was crucified. It's long. It's a wordy section where Jesus lays down his goals and his hopes. It's like his last words, for it is his last words for them. John 13, 34 and 35. A new command I give you. Love one another. As I have loved you, so you must love one another. By all this, by this, all will know that you are my disciples if you love one another. Could it be that simple? Could it actually be that simple? I was floored when we were at this first aid course and the lady says, well, if the church is going to be able to work together, then I could believe in a God like that. She turns on her heel, pivots and walks off. I was 15 years old in my first ever uh, evangelism project, as it were. I was on a team of a scripture union beach mission. We were there with people from all around Victoria that had joined together, 40 of us to share the good news of Jesus to children and families on the Mornington Peninsula. Done our very best at at communicating that. It was my first time. I was learning to get words out and and hearing uh, from others about that, how they communicated the good news of Jesus. I was learning lots. 
And then one night, it was the night before team day off, we were out a little bit later than normal. We weren't doing our program. We were just simply walking on the beach and wandering in uh, back to our tents after dark, about six of us. And there's some guys that are sitting on the fence who are uh, literally, not metaphorically, they were just sitting there like on a fence. Thank you. Um, and, they, uh, and as they sat there, they called us, oh, what are you guys, where are you going? And so we described what we were doing and how we were Christians and we were here to care for the campers and share the good news of Jesus. And they said, oh, what church are you from? And they, we said, oh, well, this guy here is from Ballarat. He's from the Anglican church. This one here is from Geelong. He's from a Baptist church. This one, whoa, 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 whoa. Aren't you guys all meant to be fighting? And we said, it was sort of a pause for a moment. And we said, we're sorry that it might have come across like that to you before. Because that so misrepresents the message of Jesus. The next question? Oh, well, what's that? And we had the privilege of sharing the gospel to these guys that night solely because we were from different churches sharing mission together and getting along with each other. Isn't that powerful? Through John, Jesus continues to share um, his, the, the, important, the things that are most important to him as he leaves his disciples. And then he labors that point from, from uh, chapter 13 in chapter 17, verse 20. Jesus prays for us, all believers. My prayer, he says, is not for them alone. I pray for those who believe in me through their message that all of them may what? Be one. Father, just as you are in me and I am in you. May they also be in us so that the world may believe that you have sent me. I have given them the glory that you gave me that they may be one as we are one. I and them, you and me. May they be brought to complete unity. He goes on in this prayer to let the world know that you sent me and have loved them even as you have loved me. What if evangelism, mission, representing God to the world rested upon our ability to get on as brothers and sisters in unity, knowing that we're not going to resolve everything, but that we can carry the same family, the same community into this world and put and represent his love in action. John 17, 17 is, or 17, 18 is a familiar one to many of us. As you sent me into the world, I have sent them into the world. It's, uh, it's the passage on which the Missio Dei is understood. Missio Dei means the mission of God. It's one of the greatest theological developments of last century. It helped us to understand that we are sent into the world with God, participating in his mission with him, in partnership with him. As God sends us, so we go into the world. An author and a practitioner called Mike Breen says this about that. We hear the theology of Missio Dei and we feel inspired by it, but we end up faltering in our practice because we lack an identity that could inform a more effective methodology. When you take Missio Dei and you combine it with a heady cocktail of Western individualism, he says, it inevitably gives rise to an individualistic methodology of mission. We think through the lens of individuals being sent on mission because we envision God as an individual on mission. However, one of the distinctive hallmarks of Christian faith is that God is not simply an individual. He 
proposes this to us. That we would think not just of the Missio Dei, we would think of the Missio Trinitus. Sorry for being a little bit complex. Latin way of saying the mission of the Trinity. In the beginning, there was a community and that community was God, Father, Son, Holy Spirit. He created out of relationship a good creation. And when he saw a person alone, he said, that is not good. And then he created for relationship and out of relationship another community. He comes and incarnates on the earth to show us what he's like. And as he begins his public ministry, the first thing he does is gather a community around him. Why? I used to think it was for efficiency. Now I think it's because it's who he is. He didn't know how to do ministry solo because that's not our God. Our God is unity. And he makes us in his reflection. And he calls us to ministry and mission that looks like him. And when we do that, when we exercise it, when we express it, my experience is it is glorious. It is effective and it is magnificent when brothers and sisters are able to work together. I want to read this uh, little prayer as a benediction. Then I'm going to throw to a, a video that describes, I guess, in a way, the heart of what's happening in Whitehorse and what, of what I'd be encouraging you to consider. And I know certainly what Nathan and some of the other uh, leaders in the area are considering. Wherever possible, could we do this together? As churches across the city, I hope that's something that wells up. As individuals in different households, I'm hoping that that's something that wells up. And my prayer as you consider this topic of crossing the road would be that we wouldn't idealize it as just us crossing the road and having to do a job that's beyond us, that's difficult to do, that we're not quite sure how to communicate. But that somewhere out of your experience would come this. A community on mission, dwelling together in unity. And my prayer, whatever the four-letter expression that might come first, is that out of that, someone might say, well, if you are going to work together, I could believe in a God like that. Jesus, we join with you this morning in your prayer. Your prayer not for us alone. Your prayer that says that you have given us the glory that you were given, that we might be one as you are one. You in us, us in you. We pray, just like you prayed, Jesus, that we would be brought to complete unity and thereby let the world know that you have sent us. You are have loved us, even as the Father loves you. In Jesus' name, amen. Thank you for listening this morning and participating in, in that. I pray that you would know the wonder of being united in so many ways as you express the Missio Trinitus. And now to, uh, I, I want to just throw to a video from a place in the UK called Teesside that have captured this in their city in the most beautiful way in a video that brings tears to my eyes and I hope it moves you as well. Have a look. Let me tell you about my church. My church is big, it's wide, it's full of variety and surprises. My church has more than 130 campuses in Teesside alone. We have campuses in the town centre. In the middle of one of the most deprived estates in the UK. We have campuses in the suburbs. We're on industrial estates. We probably have a campus just around the corner from where you live. Each campus of my church has a different expression of worship and community life. They vary dramatically in size, in style, in history and in demographics. 
My church is energetic and sometimes has skinny jeans. My church is deep and reflective and sometimes the men wear dresses. We wave incense, we light candles. We dance around in worship and throw our arms up in the air. We eat bread and we drink wine. We splash heads and we dunk all the way under. My church is black and white and Asian and we're born in Teesside and Iran and Japan and Peru. My church is feeding the poor. We are battling drug and alcohol addiction. Fighting isolation and loneliness. We're building community. We fight debt, unemployment, depression and hopelessness. We serve people in pain and those who have a past. We are out on the streets, we are in schools, community centres and prisons. We run youth groups, kids clubs, jobs clubs and counselling services. We host drop-ins, women's groups and men's breakfasts and a whole load of mums and toddlers groups. In my church, Jesus is our King. We aren't just a church building and we're not just open on Sundays. Jesus has us scattered all across Teesside. My church is in education and health and media and local government. My church is scattered like salt into every nook and cranny of Teesside. My church is like yeast working to transform our communities. We are the Church of Teesside. We are the Church of Teesside. We are the Church of Teesside. We are the Church. We are the Church. We have the same King, we have the same mission, and we are placed here in the same land. We are one church. 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 And we are transforming Teesside together.